being in youth ministry, uh, this question kind of comes up a lot. Being in youth ministry, this question comes up a lot. If, if, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? And uh, it comes up a lot mainly because I'm the one who's asking it. Uh, and I think it's just like the perfect icebreaker, you know, whether you're in a group of people or it's like one-on-one, you're trying to get to know somebody. I think it really gives you a glimpse into how someone thinks. Like uh, if they say flight, it's like, okay, all right, not, not bad, not a bad idea. Teleportation, it's like, okay, you like traveling, you don't want to deal with traffic, you don't like airports, that's, that's awesome. Mind reading, it's like, oh, okay, whoa, whoa. It's a little weird, but okay. Uh, but the one in youth ministry that always gets me is, I say, if you could have one superpower, or you could only pick one, what would it be? Uh, and there are always just a couple students that say, oh, one superpower? It would be to copy other people's superpowers. And it's like... All right, so you're going to try to cheat in the games today, like, <laughs> trying to find a workaround. But for me, I think if I could have a superpower, I, I believe that this is the only correct answer to this question. If I could have a superpower, it would be spidey senses. Now, if you're not familiar with spidey senses, it's a power that Spider-Man has. This guy? Uh, it's, it's this idea that uh, when Spider-Man is in danger, there's this little, like, tingle on the back of his neck that warns him that danger is coming. So he's like perched on top of a building and his spidey senses start going off and he like dodges just in time as this supervillain who was hiding in the shadows like tries to punch him and he just dodges. Or he's uh, talking to another superhero who he thinks is his friend and then they say something a little weird and his spidey senses go off and it's like, oh no, three issues of the comic down, this person's gonna turn into like this big betrayal and now they're a supervillain. But the spidey senses warn him of danger. And I think if I had that, man, that would be so useful. I think the most useful one would just be like everyday small situations. Like you're talking with somebody and you're walking, you come to a door and your spidey senses start tingling. It's a push, not a pull. (laughs) Or you're going upstairs and you think there's one more, but there isn't and there's like people around and and your spidey senses go, don't do that embarrassing thing or you, you think there's one more stair. But I think really the most useful uh, part of spidey senses for me would be if it could warn me that I'm about to say something stupid. Where I'm, uh, you know, spending time with my wife and I think, this joke is hilarious. She's going to love it. And my spidey senses go off and say, don't do it. You think it's a joke, but it's going to come across as an insult. Or you're hanging out with friends and you guys are kind of like, you know, play, insulting each other, it's all fun, and uh, spidey senses go off, and don't say that, you're going to take it too far, you're going to make the whole thing weird, and it's going to be awkward. Oh, thanks, spidey senses. Or you're in math class, you're focused, you're locked in, you get to something you don't understand, you raise your hand, your spidey senses go off, and it says, you're about to call your teacher mom, don't do it. Whoa, (laughs) crisis averted. I think that if we could have these th- th- this warning that we're about to say something that we wish we wouldn't, uh, that would fix so many problems in our lives. Because I think so many of us have these situations where as we're like saying a sentence, uh, as it's coming out of our mouth, our, our brains are going, well, this is not going to end well, but the sentence has already started, and now I'm on autopilot, and the sentence is going to finish, and it's gonna, I'm going to have to face the consequences afterwards. I've got a toddler at home. She's 19 months. And uh, I really understand why people say having a toddler is like a dog that slowly learns how to talk. Uh, Because we're at the point in parenting where we have to start spelling words. Uh, And so we have to ask each other, hey, after dinner, do you want to go on a W-A-L-K? I was like, does she need a B-A-T-H? Because if we're just hanging out, and we go, yeah, let's go for a walk. She goes, like, stomps over to the door and grabs the handle. It's like, oh, let's go. And it's like, it's like a whole thing. You got to eat dinner first. And the importance of these words and the consequences that come after it. We're in a series where uh, we're looking at the importance of our words. Because our words have power. Your words have power. And once they're out there, they're out there. 
My wife is a third grade teacher, and something that she does on the first day of school is uh, she breaks the students up into groups, and she gives them each like a small tube of toothpaste. And she says, okay, you've got a toothpaste, you've got the plate, squeeze all the toothpaste out onto the plate. And they're all like, this is awesome, third grade rules, and they're squeezing toothpaste out. And she goes, okay, cool, now put the toothpaste back in the tube. And they're all, it's an impossible task. Once it's out there, it's out there. And then in the same way, our words that have so much power, once they're out there, they're out there. And our words have power, and your words have way more power than you realize. Your words have more power than you realize. When I was a kid, I was uh, maybe five to seven, I don't know. I was old enough to have long-term memory, uh, but not old enough to have like critical thinking skills yet. And so I'm hanging out at the park with my mom and my brothers, and I go to grab a can of juice. And I pop the top and I go to drink it, and my mom says, whoa, hold on, hold on. Before you drink that can of juice, you have to remember to wipe down the lid, because the water that's on top, that's poison. And I was like, whew, you just saved my life. That's insane. I almost just drank this poison. I'll never forget this. And so from that point forward, every time I got a, a, a can that had soda or tea or juice in it, wipe it down with my shirt because I don't want to drink poison. Until one day in middle school, I was hanging out with some friends and uh, there was a cooler of juice and I was like, I'm going to go grab a juice. So I got up. My friend said, grab me one. So I was like, okay. So I grab him one, grab me one. I hand him his. And I wipe mine down, take my shirt, wipe it down. And he doesn't. And I'm like keeping an eye on him. I'm like, uh-oh. And then he cracks the lid and he goes to drink it. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? Why, you got to wipe it down. And I'm like expecting like a, dude, you saved my life. That was crazy. Thank you so much. I'm like, whoa, close call. Instead, he looks at me and he goes, what? I go, yeah, you got to, so you got to wipe down the juice because it's poison. And he goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> and the room starts spinning and I'm like everything I know is in question. And I'm like, oh, it was just a joke. Isn't that funny? Ha ha ha. And I go home and I go to my mom. I'm like, mom. Shoot straight with me right here. Is the water on top of a can of juice poison? And she looks at me and says, what? <laughs> I said, when I was a kid, you told me that before I drink a can of juice or soda, anything that's got condensation on the top, I have to wipe it down with my shirt because it's poison. And she says, I said that? <laughs> I was like, Mom, that changed my life forever. <laughs> that day you saved my life, and I was like, I'll never forget this. And this like, little joke that my mom was, thought was funny that morning changed the way that I lived forever. Even yesterday, I went to 7-Eleven. I got a, a can of juice. I got a soda, actually. Uh, and I looked at it, and I was like, I'm going to drink this without wiping it down. <laughs> and I was like psyching myself up, and I was like, I can't do it. I got to wipe it down. Oh. <laughs> but we all have these little things that people have spoken to us that have, that have taken us through our entire lives. Whether it's, hey, when you go fishing, you got to use this bait because your uncle, when you were a kid, told you that's the best bait. Or your grandma, when you were growing up, said, don't go to this part of town at night because it's haunted and so you avoid it. You know, but I think that beyond all of the silly little goofy things that we have in our lives, I'd wager that all of us here have the things that people have spoken to us, whether when we were growing up or recently, that play over and over in our heads when we can't sleep, when we're up late at night and we're just remembering whether it's, it's a parent that told you that uh, you're never going to amount to anything or an ex-best friend who said that you're always going to be this way and you're never going to change and you always just push people away or all of these things that people have said to you that have changed your life. It keeps you awake at night. These, these, these sentences and these phrases that keep replaying and cut you deep to the soul every time. 
we all know that our words have power. We all know that our words have much more power than we realize. One of the things that I love about um, Spider-Man, I'm a big Spider-Man fan, obviously. Uh, you can just look at me and be like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one of the big things that I like about Spider-Man is his motto. So no matter who, uh, who's playing Spider-Man in the movies or uh, what variation in the Spider-Verse, uh, the motto always goes, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's like Spider-Man's whole thing. Uh, and so with this great power that God has given us, with the words that we can speak to ourselves and to the people around us, we have a great responsibility to use them wisely to live like Jesus. In today's scripture, Proverbs 18, 21, it says, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So we're going to break this down. It's a quick scripture, but there's a lot to it. So we're going to take the first half of it and break it down for a second. Uh, first half, the tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. You know, as I was uh, researching this, as I was studying, I was like, hey, you know, the Bible wasn't written in English. Uh, and so what does the original language say? What are the words uh, that they said when they were writing this, when they were speaking this? What does that mean? So I looked it up. And the word, uh, there's, there's two words that I was really focused on, and that's life and death. And so the life, the original language, the word life translates to life. And the word for death in the original language translates to death. And so this isn't meant to be like a metaphorical, lyrical, poetical, open to interpretation. This is the Bible giving us a stark warning of the reality of the power that we have. That it's not just uh, feel good and be an encourager and be positive and have that positive mental attitude, but rather it's the Bible giving us a heads up that, hey, this is the reality, that your words have the power of life and death. You know, we regulate things like weapons and uh, the chemicals that we can buy at the store because they're dangerous. Uh, but what's crazy is that in America, the First Amendment is free speech, that you get to say whatever you want. It's great. I don't think it's a bad thing. But I think we have to ask ourselves, what's more important? our right to say whatever we want, or our responsibility to Jesus to speak life. Our right to say whatever we want, or our responsibility to Jesus to speak life. So we have a choice, and I want to encourage you to choose to speak life. Speak life. There's one of those things that's like so simple to, to, to hear, and it's like, yes, it's Great, but then the application and how you live that out is, uh, is so tough. But uh, I took a first aid class one time. I was learning how to do like CPR and stuff. Uh, and they said that the worst thing uh, in accidents and all of that is something called the bystander effect. And what that is, is when there's a big group of people and uh, let's say there's like uh, something that happens, uh, everybody looks to everybody else and says they're gonna do something about it. And so, nothing gets done because everybody is thinking somebody else is going to do something. I wonder in my life how many people uh, are going through the shore break of life and just getting tossed and slammed down and just like going through the hard time and I think, ah, somebody else will say something encouraging to them or if I send that uh, nice text that's like, hey, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you, maybe it'll make it weird so I'm just going to walk past. Somebody else got it, right? But it's, it's calling us, the Bible is calling us, Jesus is calling us to speak life to people. Not in this grandiose way of having to stand up here and like deliver a message, but rather just encouraging and loving and a being there for your friends and your family. Now this is extreme. It sounds extreme and that's because it is. But what's crazy is that Jesus takes this one step further. So in Matthew chapter five, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus is laying it down to all of the followers, uh, all of his followers. It's like, this is what it means to live in the kingdom of heaven. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 22, he says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Makes sense. Cool. Wrap it up. Nice. Thank you, Jesus. That's awesome. But then he continues. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now this word, um, Raka, this is a unique word because this is the only time that it shows up in the Bible. And this is an Aramaic term of contempt. Aramaic is the language that Jesus spoke. And so it's basically just this like insult that people would throw out at people, just kind of like uh, you just have it at the ready. Uh, and this is what Dr. William Smith says in the Smith's Bible Dictionary. It says, Raka denotes a certain looseness of life and manners, while fool in the same passage means a downright wicked and reprobate person. This is scary because it's so easy for me to just throw out all these little insults, whether I'm uh, just driving and someone cuts me off and I'm like, ah, this donkey, look at how they're driving. Or uh, someone says something that I don't agree with and I just dismiss them and I cut. And it's this heart that we have to just cut down and, uh, and tear down the people that we just don't think twice about. And uh, if I could just real quick encourage and uh, challenge. We're coming up on an election year, and so there's like, you know, ads and debates and everything going on. This goes for the people who are on the other side of the political aisle of you. Because it's so easy to dehumanize and look over there and just like say, they don't get it, they'll never get it. Uh, they're, they're just fools. They're, they're, they don't know what, they, what they're thinking. Uh, but Jesus calls us to speak life. And there are ways to disagree without dehumanizing. There are ways to disagree without dehumanizing. So this goes for what we say to our family members, to our coworkers, to our bosses, our teachers, uh, our friends, and our family. Uh, and it goes, spoiler alert, it goes for uh, what we say and post online too. Uh, I spend way too much time on Instagram. I'm just going to be honest about it. And the way that Instagram's algorithm works is if someone that I'm following comments on a post, their comment goes to the top. So it's like really easy for me to see. And sometimes I'm scrolling and someone's comment that I know pops up and it's like, oh, uncle, oh, did you really mean to say that? Is that like an autocorrect situation? That's kind of, that's kind of intense. Or like, oh, auntie, I don't hear you talk like that on Sunday morning. <laughs> This idea that Jesus calls us to, to speak life, goes for the people that we interact with face to face, the people that we interact with online in the comment section, what we post, and it goes uh, for the wide scale public figures like politicians and athletes and celebrities, even down to the minutia of the coworker who just, you just don't get along with or who likes the wrong sports team. Broncos fans are people too. <laughs> it's possible to disagree without dehumanizing. In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 23 and 24, it says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Our words have power. And we have to ask ourselves, what is more important? Our right to say whatever we want or the responsibility that we have to speak life like Jesus? All right, so that was the first. The tongue is the power of life and death. That was the first half. Now let's get into the second half of the proverb, uh, that those who love it will eat its fruit. Those who love the tongue will eat its fruit. Uh, I rent a place where we don't have a yard, uh, but we went to... Home Depot and Lowe's and whatever, and we got like these little planter boxes. And so we have this little tiny garden outside of our house. And uh, I got to choose. Well, I didn't get to choose. It was a teamwork, cooperation between me and my wife. But we got to choose what we grow. I'm going to be straight up. I've got nothing to prove. I do not grow chili peppers because uh, I am way too holly for that. 
I, I do not handle spice. I grew up in Kailua, so I grow kale. <laughs> Bro, my kale chips will blow your mind. They're so good. But I get to choose, we get to choose what we grow in the garden in front of our house. Uh, my wife, my daughter, and me are part of this exclusive club. There's only three members, and it's called the Pua Patrol. Uh, and this is the Pua Patrol. Whenever we go on WALKs or hikes, uh, if there's a flower, uh, my daughter loves to smell flowers. And so if we're going and she sees a flower, she goes, Pua. I'm like, all right. So we walk over. She's in a little backpack while we're hiking. I lean over, and she smells the flower, and then we just go on to the next one. And so we were like, hey, we've got this little space where we can put an extra planter box, so why don't we like, take her to the store, and we'll get all this stuff together, and we'll grow some flowers in our front yard. And it's like, that's a great idea. Uh, and so we have this little planter box where there's flowers growing, and she like, walks over to them, and she smells them, and goes, mmm, and then she's like, high five, blah. Uh, and she's just like soaked. And it's awesome to see just this like, little person who's enjoying life. But I have to ask myself, I wonder if I'm taking the same intentionality and the same care in the words that I use around her, the words that I use to her and around her. That I, I was so stoked on having this little uh, chunk of the garden uh, where she can just uh, have life and enjoy herself. And I, I'm wondering if the words that I speak, not only to her, but when she's around, are building that same environment of life. And I really, really hope so, because this is what the garden looks like right now. This is the flower garden. Don't get your hopes up. Ay, ay, ay. I never said I was good at it. <laughs> said I was trying. <laughs> when my daughter is an adult and someone says, you sound like your dad, I want that to be a compliment. I want to make sure that I, right now, am speaking life because I want to eat the fruit of life. You know, there's Sunday, some Sunday mornings during like mango season where we come to church and it's like, okay, we're here at church. And then someone walks in and they've got like a cardboard box full of mangoes. And it's like, yes and amen. I receive the blessing of the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Or they walk in with like a, a garbage bag full of oranges, and it's like, yes, amazing, all that. And uh, if, if you have like a mango tree or an orange tree, and you have like a bunch of fruits, usually you give them away. And uh, I think most all of us, if we're giving away fruits or we're cooking for people, we usually try to give them like the best ones, you know? Like we're not gonna take all the best ones and be like, yeah, you can have this mushy one that's half eaten from a bird, whatever. But how many of us like, are, are giving our best words and our best uh, uh, times to other people and we're not like, saving them and like, building up for our family and for the people that uh, mean the most to us? It's difficult because like, this is not easy. It's way easier said than done. But the question is, what fruit do you want to eat? Do you want to eat the fruit of life? or the fruit of death. Some of us may be thinking that in the, in the gardens of our lives, it's overgrown with weeds. And we're not proud of it. And we haven't been taking the time to speak life, to grow the fruits of life. But Jesus is not here saying, well, it's uh, one and done, you had your shot, it's over. Instead, Jesus is standing waiting for you with gardening gloves on and a lawnmower running and he's saying jump in we get to do this together that we can uh, turn the tides and we can rework this garden that you can uh, turn the soil and begin to speak life and pull the weeds out that we don't want we have the chance to work together with Jesus and with his spirit to grow the fruits that we want to eat in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, it says, uh, do, not let anyone, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, and it may benefit those who listen. If you were to take an inventory of this past week, give it a percentage, 
What percentage uh, was speaking life, and what percentage was speaking death? Is it a 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, one way or the other? What percentage uh, are we speaking, and how are we speaking life? Hey, can I talk to the parents real quick, all of the parents in the room? Now, I've got a toddler, so I've got it all figured out. I know everything. And that was really funny, right, guys? I'm not here as an expert. I'm not here saying, okay, here's the gentle parenting seminar or 10 tips to raise your family in a God-honoring way. But instead, I'm just saying, like, man, thank you for what you do. If you're a parent who's speaking life, it can be a very thankless job. But as a former teenager, I know that uh, there were times when my parents, my aunties and uncles, the people at church were speaking life over me. And I didn't say thank you or show appreciation in the moment. But now, as an adult, I can look back and say, man, these people were speaking this life into me. And so I know that it's tough, and I know that it's hard, but I, I just want to encourage you to keep speaking life over your children. Because if I can be honest, I think right now is probably the hardest it's ever been to be a teenager. There is a time pre-internet where me growing up, I remember where I had to wait for my mom to get off the phone before I could go on the internet. And that was like back in the day. But all of the kids growing up now don't have that, where they have had constant connectivity. And while that is great and we can learn anything that we want, it's also really scary because there are people on social media, on TikTok, on YouTube, just like covered in filters. They don't have a single blemish. And they're saying, this is just, I woke up like this. This is what a normal human is supposed to look like. And it's this impossible standard that we can't achieve. Or there's uh, people on, our pho- on your phones telling a young men, hey, if you're not making $10,000 a day, then you like miss the boat. You got to watch this, attend my course. And it's like, man, I know that there are eight-year-olds starting YouTube channels and becoming multimillionaires. And I know there are 15-year-olds who are seeing that and saying, did I miss the boat already? Like, did I, did I miss my chance to be successful, to make it? So I, I just want to keep encouraging you to speak life because it's, it's, it's tough. But if we can build that structure, build that garden where our, our children can come and rest and eat the fruit of life, then that's important. A scripture that I keep coming back to is uh, in Malachi. Malachi is the last uh, book of the Old Testament. So the last scripture of Malachi, the the last verse before the New Testament is this. It's it's looking forward to the work that Jesus is going to do. And it's Malachi 4, verse 6. It says that he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. And so this is not meant to be like a, hey, parents, do better, say more nice things, even when your teen is slamming the door and yelling at you. This is not that. Rather, this is an invitation to uh, let Jesus change your heart and turn your heart towards your children. And at Alive, they're meeting upstairs right now. Uh, Parents aren't the enemy. We're on your team. We want to be part of that uh, community that is speaking life. We don't say parents just don't understand, but we try to get the students to know that they are part of God's kingdom and they have a part to play. But don't just take my word for it. I want to invite up somebody who went through our youth ministry and now is a leader in our youth ministry. So could you help me as we welcome up Sage this morning? I don't know. I don't know if this is on. Wait. There we go. Hi, Sage. Hi, Willie. How's it going? Pretty good. Just came down from Alive. I think they're coming down too. So. Oh, awesome. We get to see them. Uh, all right. So. Sage, you went through our youth ministry, you're an adult now, but uh, tell us about what like high school was like for you. So high school, I went to Iolani, and I was a typical achieving type of kid, you know. I wanted to take as many honors, as many APs as I could. I tried to get involved in pretty much everything. I was on every committee, I was the head of almost every committee, and I played basketball, volleyball, and I spent all of my time filling my time because, you know, I just wanted to achieve as much as I could and do as much as I could because that's where I found my self-worth in high school. So everything was perfect? 
Um, I don't think so. So it seemed pretty good for the most part. And you know, I think my parents were pretty proud of me. I was like, everything seemed good because I was getting good grades for the most part. I was involved in everything. I stayed out of trouble. But high school was also one of the hardest times of my life because you know, when you're doing all of these things and you're constantly under all this pressure to just perform and do well in everything you do, there comes a point when you don't get that A in your class. You get a C, you, get, you fail a class. There comes a point when you don't make that sports team that you wanna make. You don't, you're not on the starting lineup. And when you reach that point and you finally don't perform like how you've been performing your whole life, you just don't know what to do, and everything falls apart. Yeah, so uh, it was kind of around that time when you really got involved at Alive. Um, so what was that like for you? Yeah, so when I first came to Alive, I actually was brought to this church by Auntie Racy. I don't know if you guys know Racy Botello. She's she's great. She's always here. Um, but she's best friends with my mom. They've been friends for really, really long time, and she invited me to church, and she's like, hey, why don't you come to our youth ministry, which is alive, and get involved there, and when I first came, I wasn't really into it, you know, I just went, I sat in the back, I didn't, I wasn't really interested because I was in high school, and I was so busy with what I was doing that I didn't care, but then, you know, when things got hard, I, I needed something else. I needed someone to support me. I needed a little more, and you know, my parents tried. They really did try, you know. They tried to be there for me. They tried to get me help when I needed it, but just I needed some sort of community, and then that's the point that I got introduced to Alive. Yeah, and so uh, you were telling me about times where you would show up to Alive, and then you would not come into actual service. Yeah, so <laughs> alive high schoolers, you might have this moment too. But there were plenty of nights when I was in alive and I would never actually make it to the point where Willie was talking because I would be in that bathroom out there, that women's bathroom. I'd be on the floor crying the whole entire time for like two hours. And you know, Thank you to Ashley Ann Paul. She's amazing. I love Ashley, but I had my group of leaders to support me. So I had Auntie Jojo, who's still with Alive now, and I had Auntie Gail Berger, and I had Ashley and Paul. But you know, during those times when I was on that floor of the bathroom, the greatest thing that they could have done for me was, like Willie's been saying, they spoke life to me. Because you know, when your life is falling apart and you don't know what to do as a high schooler, sometimes you don't need a person necessarily just to tell you that it's gonna be okay, but they told me why it was gonna be okay. They told me that God had a plan for me despite everything that was going on, and despite me feeling like I wasn't good enough, like I wasn't gonna be able to achieve everything that I wanted, that my whole life was basically over because I failed a class, you know? It took them being there for me, not only with their words, but with their actions, and just creating that community, and they got me through high school, basically. So with that community that was speaking life um, to you, uh, your parents, aunties, uncles, leaders at Alive, uh, why is it important for you now to be a leader? Oh, I love this question. So I have always loved youth ministry. I was with the littles before, and now that I get to be with Alive upstairs, um, I love being able to bring it back full circle, you know? Because being in middle, being in high school, it's one of the hardest times of your life. It's a time when you're dealing with social pressures, you're dealing with academic pressures, you're dealing with family and friends pressures too. So it's like everything's all coming together and it just takes someone being there for you. Because parents, I know you wanna be there for your kids and I promise your kids love you. But when it comes to some stuff, there's just stuff that your kids don't wanna talk about. That's just the truth of it, that's just what it is. And that's why we're there. And it's not necessarily about giving them answers. It's just about being there for them and being sure that we're not gonna solve their problems for them. It's not a one and done type of thing, but it's more so that they're not gonna be alone through whatever they're going through. That God's gonna be with them and that we as leaders are gonna be with them too.
Yeah, and you're saying that uh, even though you're a leader in our youth ministry, it doesn't take a title or a designation uh, to be someone who speaks life uh, into people. So it could be your coworkers, uh, your children at home, your family, your friends, even just all these goobers on a Sunday morning as they're running around grabbing coffee yeah. and uh, ripping open the hot cocoa packets and making a mess. Yep. Anyone, I think that's one of the greatest things I've learned is that anyone can be a leader, basically, you know, because it's a choice, the words that you say to the younger generation, you can choose to speak life to them. And something that I just learned because I got to go to camp with everyone this summer, but it's that when it comes to speaking life, it's not about having the right words to say to someone. It's about having God's words. You know, God's going to put the right words to say to them because there's no right or wrong. You don't know. Everything comes from God. So, yeah. We just say thank you to Sage. I'm proud of you. Our youth ministry is in the back. They came down to uh, watch Sage and help support her. Bye, guys. Have fun upstairs. I miss you. <laughs> I want to encourage us that we all have a part to play. Uh, one of the big takeaways uh, for me from Sage's testimony uh, was that people didn't have to like kick down the door of her life and do it all themselves. They weren't like, I'm going to solve every problem that you have. But rather, it was an encouraging word from her mom or um, from an auntie or just like a consistent showing up from leaders, not saying, here's the solution to your problem, but that you're going to be okay, that God still loves you and still has a plan for you, uh, and, and that we're going to go through this together. This is a lot easier said than done. I know that it's really hard. It's, it's this great, like, okay, we can do this. Let's go be encouraging. Uh, but there are moments when it's really hard. And so in that time, uh, it, it is when we depend on and, and lean on the power of God's spirit to help us. In his book, uh, The Prodigal God, Tim Keller writes, what makes you faithful or generous, or in this case, someone who speaks life, is not just a redoubled effort to follow moral rules. Rather, all change comes from deepening your understanding of the salvation of Christ and living out the changes that understanding creates in your heart. Faith in the gospel restructures our motivations, our self-understanding, our identity, and our view of the world. Behavioral compliance to rules without heart change will be superficial and fleeting. It's great to be encouraged to go and speak life, to be uh, an encouraging person, and to be positive. But that's only going to last so long. It's when we know the power that God has to change our hearts and to empower us to do this, not only in the times when things are great and everything's going good and you're walking down the hallway giving everybody a high five, uh, but when times are tough and you're tired and you're hangry and you just want to snap. It's when we lean into the power of, of God's spirit that we get to do this. So here are three things that we can do that will help us out. Number one is ask God for help. This is that uh, take a breath. You just, uh, when my toddler asks for toast, and then I give her toast, and then she's mad at me because I gave her toast. It's like, okay, God, help me out here. It's that moment where you get to work and everything is wrong and you left it so well, but everybody ruined it and you're ready to just lay down the law and start like kicking butt and taking names. That moment where you take a breath and you say, okay, God, help me to speak life. Number two is to join a growth group. Having a community around you is so, so important. Having a place where you can, where not only can you speak life, but other people can speak life into you, that you can vent and let out your frustrations in a healthy way, 
where these people are not just going to say, yeah, that's the worst, but rather like, okay, I'm sorry that you're going through that, but I'm here with you and you can do this. They're speaking that life into you. We have incredible growth groups here at Metro, these small groups where you can find your people, you can find your fit, that when uh, things are great and you're on the mountaintop, you can celebrate with them. And when, when you need a helping hand, they're there for you. On our website, there's uh, the growth group finder where you can just easily scroll through the groups and find something that works for you and you can find your people. We also have this uh, growth group guide. It just makes it so easy. If you weren't here last week, we talked about this, but we have like a a bunch of extra copies of this. we're, We're continuing to print these because we believe that being in community helps us to live like Jesus. And so uh, if you're not in a growth group, can I just encourage you uh, to jump into one because having that community that's speaking life into you when you need it, uh, and you're not just turning to social media or uh, the people that are not gonna give you the advice that you need to hear, that are not gonna speak life to you, is so important. The last one is to let Jesus change your heart. Many of us have deep wounds uh, of, of things that people have said to us. Whether it was we were growing up or a pivotal moment in our lives where someone cut deep and it's just stuck there. And this is not a uh, raise your hand for prayer and it's like fixed right in an instant, but it's rather having that community that's gonna walk with you as you work with Jesus to do the hard work of forgiveness and letting go and accepting healing from Jesus. One of the the things that really helped me was this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality where through walking through this with community uh, and with my wife, it was like, oh, I never realized, like, I forgot that that person said that to me and that's why I react in this way uh, when someone says something similar. It's this long, difficult process uh, that we here at Metro are committed to walking you through, walking through with you. And we have these growth groups so that we can begin to do this work. That as we invite God into the garden of our hearts, that we say, okay, God, uh, just start pulling the weeds and I'll be right there with you. That we do this difficult work together as we seek to take responsibility for our words, which have so much power. Would you stand with me as we close? I'd love to close in just a quick time of reflection. I'm going to ask three questions, uh, and I just invite you to uh, reflect on these questions uh, with Jesus. Uh, And these three questions are pulled directly from the growth group guide week two. Uh, which is what we're in right now. So would you close your eyes and open your heart to what Jesus wants to say to you? But if you consider the past week, do you bring more life or death with your words? How can you speak life when you want to say something else? Who do you have influence over? Does what you say to them bring life? Jesus, I ask, I ask that you would just help us to live like you. Because speaking life sometimes feels like an impossible task. But God, we know that for you, nothing is impossible. I ask that you would help to show us how uh, your spirit can fill us and help us to lay down our lives, to say, I, I want to say this, but God, you're, I know that that is not a speaking life. So God, would you help me? Would you help us to find community, the people that are going to help us and speak life into our lives when we need it and that are going to be able to help us to do the difficult work of letting you, Jesus, change our heart. Holy Spirit, would you just begin speaking and working and uh, 
rotating the soil that is in our hearts that uh, we've come to just think of as normal. But God, would you show us how much life and how much healing and how much uh, beauty is, is available when we depend on you, Jesus. God, we ask for your help. Lord, help us to speak life. I just pray that your spirit and your hand would be upon this church and these people and this community. And it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Would you thank the Lord for everything that he's doing?